It's a real privilege to be back, standing behind this pulpit, for I think it's probably 30 years of my life that I actually pastored in this church. In two years, and that's a lot of my ministerial time, so this sure feels like home, and it's good to see you sitting in your places, and good to see Pat at the keyboard, just love to uh, to be here, love to be here and worship the Lord. And so, as we do, we want to lift our hearts unto God in a word of prayer, and then we'll turn to our first hymn, number 236, which is Amazing Grace, and I'm so thankful that I'm up here because I don't have to wear a mask here, but I'm glad to see you all masked up. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of coming into your house today coming to worship you, coming to praise your holy name, coming to rejoice with one another that we love you and you love us and you draw near to us. So draw near to us today, Father, and help us to lift our hearts in praise to you and in honor to you in Jesus' name. And let's turn to 236 in your hymnal and sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Thank <laughs> Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our 
does interesting and marvelous things. I was uh, sharing with some just as we were coming into church that there was something on my mind that I just didn't know which way to go. And I, as I, Friday morning, as Marilyn and I were praying, and I just said, God, would you help me in that? And it was just in an instant, uh, they, the thought came into my mind uh, so much so that I, I literally quit praying. I don't know whether Marilyn thought that was strange or not, but uh, there was just a silence. And But it was that silence of, wow, thank you, Lord. He is such an awesome God. He knows our needs. He knows our thoughts. He, he knows everything. And, and just, uh, sometimes I wish he'd tell me a little earlier, but, uh, <laughs> but he, always, he always comes through, and we praise him for that. Let's lift our hearts to God in prayer for these needs and for the needs of our country, the needs of our community, because our communities are suffering, and if, if what they're telling us is, is happening and we're watching it happening, this is not going to get better immediately. So let's pray and ask God to just intervene for, for communities, for families, for those in the medical field that, that are being overwhelmed with what's happening. Let's just pray. Father, we come to you this morning with thankful hearts because you are God. And we are confident, Lord, that, that all things, you are aware of all things and, and nothing happens that you're not, not right there knowing all about it. And Lord, we don't understand all these things. We don't understand, but Father, we do come to you because you are the one that can supply our every need. So Father, we, we bring these ones that have been mentioned before you. Each one, Lord, that your hand would be upon them. You would minister to those who need physical healing, that, that you would bring that. For, Father, for those who need encouragement along the way, and Lord, many, many need your encouragement, that need something to, to lift their spirits, and so we pray that you would lift their spirits today. Father, for those who are caring for others in the hospital and, and, and concerned about the Lord, we just pray that you keep your hand upon those health care workers and those who are on the front lines of this. Uh, Lord, as you undertake, would you undertake for our nation? We need you, Lord. We need a, a revival in our nation, Lord. We need a revival in the nations of the world. Lord, you are the only one who can do this. And so we just bring every need before you and praise you for what you are doing and praise you for what you will also continue to do. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's do another hymn this morning, number 258. Uh, if you, you know me well enough, you know I like to sing. And so uh, let's sing, He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, 258, and covers me there with his hand. <laughs> Oh, 
Once again, I, I I had people say, "What's coming? What what's going to happen? You know, where are we going?" Well, <laughs> I like this verse because it tells me where I'm going. It doesn't matter what happens down here. It doesn't matter how I go. It matters where I go. And when clothed in his brightness, transported, I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. Wow! Uh, leave this old world and all its troubles behind. Uh, one of the songwriters said, I'm going higher someday. Well, praise the Lord. Let's sing this with, without uh, joy in our heart. When clothed in his brightness, transported, I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. opportunity to do it quite as often as I used to. And it used to be every Sunday and twice on Sunday and sometimes midweek. I find sharing different now because often I'm sharing one-on-one. -on -one. Somebody calls me up and I'm praying with them and uh, talking with them and then once in a while somebody might even stop by at the door or at the store shopping. I have found people are ready to talk about the things of God as you're coming in there to the store. Masks on, all, the, all those precautions, but, but they're willing to talk about God. They're willing to talk about, about serious things. Used to be they just talk, well, it's nice weather today, isn't it? And now we're finding people ready to talk about more serious things. Anyway. So that's what we're going to be doing this morning. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And my reading this morning will be from the King James Version, which is the one I grew up with. And most of the scripture references that I will be referring to will be from the New King James. So uh, there will be that little change, but uh, that's not a serious one. Ephesians chapter 2, and let's read the first nine verses of this chapter. And you have he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, whereof in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, I like that, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, or made us alive, quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any 
man should boast, or lest anyone should boast. Very, very interesting, the words of the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Spirit of God to write to this church. Most of you who know me, and I, I, you all do, you, you've all, uh, I've, I've had the privilege of ministering to you many times, and you know me by now that I would like to put a title on the message, because sometimes the title will stick in our mind and we'll forget many things, but somehow that comes back and helps us remember other points. So I put a title on this one, Do I Need Grace? I can speak for myself, but I think this morning I can speak for all of us, you who are here, those who may normally attend the church, and but because of situations, the COVID situation or the restrictions, or because they don't just feel it might be there, seeing this a little later on the uh, internet, or perhaps there's someone who has just dropped in, as it were, found us online by accident. Do we need grace? So my immediate answer to this is yes, an absolutely astounding yes. I need grace. I'm not going to count my failures. I'm not going to list them for you. Time's too short. But I will readily admit that if I were judged by the absolute perfect law of God, I will fall so far short. And I would reference the scripture that Paul writes in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, we can say emphatically, no matter who we are, no matter what our situation, we can say emphatically, we all need grace. But what is grace? <laughs> there, there are probably many people will try to figure out what grace is, but let me just share two or three that uh, where someone has tried to put a definition on this. And this first one sounds pretty theological. The second one might sound a little more philosophical. And the third one will be very practical. So the first one I would share is grace is the spontaneous, unmerited gift of the divine favor in the salvation of sinners. That's pretty theological, isn't it? Well, I think this one is a little more philosophical. Grace is the love and the mercy given to us by God because God desires us to have it, not necessarily because of anything we've done to earn it. Now, the last one probably helps most of us. We live in an age when we always choose letters to identify you know, the WHO, you know, that's not, that's not who, that's the World Health Organization. Well, let's try grace in that same way. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. He paid the price. It was the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cruel cross that provided salvation as a gift to mankind. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. We did not earn it. But we do have to acknowledge our sinfulness in repentance. It's the only way. The message of Peter on the day of Pentecost was repent. The message of John the Baptist as he introduced Christ was repent. The message of Jesus was repent. And repentance is a sense of being sorry that we have gone the wrong way. Even the Apostle Paul said, I did all these things ignorantly and unbelievably. 
I, I didn't really know I was doing wrong, but when I understood it, I repented. Peter declares to the religious leaders of his day as they challenge him in the fourth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles in verse 12. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. This is grace. I really don't know how many times grace is mentioned in the Bible. But from cover to cover, we will find grace. Noah found grace and escaped the flood. Moses found grace and led Israel out of Egypt's bondage. Esther found grace and saved a nation from annihilation. David found grace after his heinous sins and acts, and yet was the ruler of Israel. Probably the person who expresses grace more than anyone else is the Apostle Paul. Every letter, the letters he writes, are filled with grace. He thought he was right when he was destroying the Christian faith. He said, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. But, but let me tell you, ignorance does not make it right. Many things that I did, I didn't know was wrong. And I needed grace to forgive me. But there have been many things in my life that I did that I knew was wrong. And I needed grace. So repentance is there and grace. Ignorance does not make it right. And with the Apostle Paul, he found the amazing grace through Jesus Christ. Literally, grace made the worst of sinners the best of saints. Grace changes who we are. That when we receive that grace from God, when the light comes and we repent, we become a new creature in Christ Jesus. We would look at the letters that Paul wrote in, in the New Testament. I believe there are 14 that we officially know that he wrote. To, there's another one that's in question, but I, so I won't include that. But in the 14 letters that he wrote, we find these words in 10 of them, consistently, Grace and peace, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his salutation. That was his introduction to almost every church and every person that he wrote letters to that we have record of. And in a few of them, he turns around and finishes the letter with saying, grace and peace to you. So he Puts it in on both sides, grace and peace at the beginning, at the end, and, and packs a whole bunch of stuff in the middle. It's like a good sandwich. The bread is good, but what's in the middle really, really helps. So Paul packs a lot of stuff into the word. Peter mentions those same words in his letters. The Apostle John mentions it in the book of Revelation. So all through the Bible, from, the, from Genesis to Revelation, we find the grace of God provided through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as the theme that runs all through the Bible, all from cover to cover. The songwriter said, grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. <coughs> but how do we experience God's grace? Today, on how do we experience the grace of God? And there are different expressions of God's grace. I believe the answer to the question of receiving God's grace, that God's grace is expressed to us in our daily lives. I think back over 58 years of ministry in my own life, 
And I have not met one person yet that cannot say, but for the grace of God, I would not be here. I, I'm still looking for that per, first person that can, that hasn't got at least one incident in their life where they say, the only answer to this is God. And I find that, personally, I have several times to point to in my life. Some in my childhood, some in my youth, and some in my adult life. Times that had nothing to do with my spiritual life at all. Just times that, that God somehow intervened. And had he not intervened, I would have been gone. Some unknown disaster. The only answer I can find for life as I see it is that God intervenes. God extends his grace in unknown ways to spare us from disaster. But I want to talk about saving faith, saving grace. Grace that brings about salvation and the hope of eternal life. So let's take inside of some of those letters of the Apostle Paul, between those pieces of bread in the sandwich that we talked about, Let's look at some of the scriptures. We've already mentioned one in Romans 3 and 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But let's look at Romans 6 and 23 because Romans 6 and 23 gives us something very astounding when we think of it. If all have sinned, Romans 6 23 says the wages of sin is death. To continue in sin is to experience a spiritual death. Jesus gave the illustration of the vine and the branches. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And if the branch is hooked into me, if the branch is receiving life from me, it continues to live. But if the branch is severed from the vine, I know what that's like. I've been doing some trimming of the brush around my house during this, this time when, when they tell me I'm not supposed to go anywhere and I'm not supposed to meet anybody. I've been spending a lot of time around my place cutting brush. And I cut the brush off down near the ground and I come back a few days later and the leaves are all withered. There's still some, some stability in the branch itself, but, but I come back the next year and I do that with that branch and it goes snap. It's totally dead. The life is gone. So when we are separated from God, when we are separated from Jesus Christ, sin takes its wage and life, spiritual life, saps out of us. But I want you to remember the rest of Romans 6 and 23. You see, the Bible never leaves us in despair. The Bible tells us what the problem is, but gives us an answer. I don't know how about you, but have you ever gone to the doctor and say, I, you know, I've got this problem, doctor. I, I'm not sure what it is, but it hurts here. And he looks you over and checks you over and he says, well... This is what the problem is. You have this particular thing. Now, we're going to try this and see if it works. Try it for a couple of weeks, and if it works, okay. And if it doesn't, come back and see me. And then, well, okay, well, let's try this. And it seems to be a trial and error until they find the right answer. Well, I'm thankful that the Bible gives us the right answer. It diagnoses the problem well. All have sinned. All have been disobedient to God. And the wages of sin is death. But here's the answer. The gift of God. Can I say through grace? Is 
eternal life through Jesus Christ. It's truly and effectively by grace that we are saved. God's part is grace. Our part is faith. Remember that first verse we read that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God but but ye are saved by grace through faith. So let's take a moment this morning and examine faith. We've examined grace. We, we've looked at God's part and, and God's part is finished. But what is faith? Oh, I know we can quote the passage from Hebrews that tells us exactly what faith is. But again, let me take a couple of statements that someone has come up with. I, I think they're pretty good. Faith is just believing that what God said is true. How's that fit? Faith is believing what God said is true. And our actions prove what our faith really is. I think of an illustration that, that I, I did in Western Canada one time where one of the young pastors was in church and, and we were trying to illustrate faith. So I made plans with one of the young men. I said, I'm, I'm going to get this young pastor to come to the front of the church and, and I'll, I'll have him stand here and tell him that I provided a chair for him to sit on and, and to sit down. While I am in keeping him entertained, I want you to slip up and put a chair right behind him. And he came up with no, and there was no chair there. I said, turn around, face the congregation. And he did. And I kept him entertained while the chair was put in behind him. But he didn't know it was there. I said, all right, John, sit down in the chair that I have provided for you. And he looked at me with this. Look, I have provided you a chair, John, sit down. And he, his knees buckled a little, and then he straightened back up. He said, John, I have provided a chair for you. Please sit down. And he, I, I think about four times that he went partway down and come back up. And then he, I said, do you have faith? And he sat down and the chair fell to the first. You see, our faith is really shown by our action. And if we have faith in God, then we believe what God said is true. We believe that the wages of sin is death. We believe that the gift of God is eternal life. And we, we act on that belief. You've probably heard the story of the gorge in Niagara Falls and and the gentleman that walked the tightrope over the gorge. I've heard it many times, but I went and looked it up just to see what was happening. And I couldn't have told you the man's name, but his name was Charles Blondin. The date was September the 4th, 1860. That's a little while ago. But he walked on that tightrope, a two-inch rope, over the Niagara Gorge while 11,000 people watched. On that two-inch rope stretched across, he walked over the gorge. And he turned around and walked back. There's stories about a lot of other things he did, but I, I'm going to skip all that. They tell me that, that he did then take his manager on his back and walked across again and walk back. And after that, he took a wheelbarrow and filled, put bricks in the wheelbarrow, put a good load of bricks in the wheelbarrow, and he walked across that again, pushing the wheelbarrow load of bricks and turned around and walked back. And the crowd were, you just, just they, they were just so excited. They said, yes, yes, and, and cheering. He said, do you believe that I can do this with a man in the wheelbarrow? 
Oh yes, oh yes, we believe, we believe you, you can, you can take a man in a wheelbarrow and take him across the gorge and bring him back. He looked at the one man who was the greatest cheer in front of him, you get in the barrel. Well, out of those 11,000 people that were cheering, not one person ventured to get in the barrel. You see, what we say with our mouth and what we act with our lives are often two different things. They can say, oh yes, I have faith that uh, I have faith that you can take somebody else across there. But don't rest my life with Faith is good when it looks at somebody else, but when faith comes down to the test, it's our faith that counts. Faith is not in what you say. Faith is in what you're willing to do. So what's the faith that accepts God's grace and brings salvation? The Apostle Paul writing to the people in Rome, telling them about the grace and the peace, says it this way. It's recorded in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. And this again is the New King James Version. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now remember, it's not just what we say with our mouth. <laughs> we, we just declare that, that, that our mouth, when we confess, we are telling the truth. So when we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, we're actually saying we have active faith in Jesus, what he said and what he does. So if we confess, I know this morning that I'm speaking to people in this church who have been here time and time again. I know I'm speaking to you and not sharing something new and startling that you've never heard before. I know that there are people that truly believe. I know there are people who are going to hear this message as they watch this service on their computers or on their phones later on. I know that there may be someone, and I pray that someone who has simply just dropped in and never been here, never been in this situation before, and has tuned into this message and has heard these words for the first time that we've all sinned, that the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life, and that we have genuine faith in Jesus Christ, and we confess that faith in Jesus Christ with our mouth, there is salvation that gives us forgiveness of sin and hope of heaven. So to all of you, I ask the question, do you truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you truly believe that he lives today? He is not a dead Christ. He is a living Christ. Do you truly believe that he is the only means of salvation? And if you do, will you put action to your faith this morning and receive this grace that brings salvation through Jesus Christ. There's a song in your hymn book I would like to share with you, I'd like to sing with you. It's one used by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association over and over again. Just as I am, without one plea. Number 249 in your hymn book. We'll sing three verses, verse 1, verse 3, and verse 5, as we bring the service to a close.
Jesus' name and for the glory of God. 